Good afternoon. I'm retired General Kip Ward, the inaugural commander of United States Africa Command. I am pleased to welcome you and open today's discussion with the Honorable Dr. Vincent Baruda, Minister of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation, and the Honorable Ms. Jean Diarc Mojawa Mariah, Minister of the Environment, the Republic of Rwanda, here at the Africa Center during their official visit to Washington, D.C. Today's conversation is part of the larger Africa Center High Level Conversation Series. This series by the Africa Center has hosted prominent figures, including the Prime Minister of Cote d'Ivoire, His Excellency Patrick Achi, Chair of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, Representative Gregory Meeks, and the U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations, Ambassador Linda Thomas Greenfield, among others. Convening high level speakers is one of the key tools utilized by the Africa Center to promote its pillars of work focused on prosperity, the rule of law, multilateralism, and the newest program, the creative and cultural industries. As an institute of research, the Africa Center has produced reports on commercial policy for climate finance and on the Sahel. On the event side, the Africa Center hosted the Sahel Development Summit, bringing together the G5 Regional Ministers of Economy a few days before the recent ECOWAS gathering, and most recently, completing the Sports Business Forum that took place in Dakar, Senegal, alongside the National Basketball Association activities. So stand by for more to come. The mission at the Atlantic Council is to co contribute to a collaborative shaping of the global future. And as one of the esteemed centers at the Atlantic Council, the Africa Center's mission is to promote African voices and contribute to the strengthening of African nations' influence in the transatlantic dialogue as an enhancement to the African narrative promoting stability and positive growth. The timing of this event is significant as the world is trying to reshape a coronavirus-impacted economic sector. This is coupled with Russia's war on Ukraine, soundly denounced by the majority of the global community, including Rwanda's support for the United Nations General Assembly resolution condemning the Russian invasion and sending Western allies into unprecedented co consequences and collective action. These major happenings have indeed an impact on Africa. From improving health security through enhanced global health systems to taking concrete steps in eliminating food security to boost economic recovery. Africa's role in this emerging geopolitical order is critical. As an influential regional player, Rwanda still faces domestic political challenges and persistent security instability in the Great Leaks. Leading up to the spring IMF and World Bank meetings taking place next month, the international community would like to understand more about Rwanda's role at a local, regional, and international level. Through numerous personal visits to Rwanda and over several conversations with President Kagame and other senior cabinet officials, I am personally aware of the historic role Rwanda has taken in many areas, including in addressing linkages between economic development, social and civic responsibility, and security challenges in seeking lasting solutions. I understand this journey remains a work in progress. The audience is keen to hear what type of continued cooperation Rwanda expects from the United States in addressing a range of concerns. In this context, the ministers are visiting Washington and will provide an outlook on security matters, economic and social development, democracy, governance, and multilateralism. Today's conversation provides a platform for us to receive firsthand information on these matters from the foreign minister and minister of environment. And in conjunction with Africa Center senior fellows who will offer their perspective and analysis, I look forward to this discussion. But first, I invite Ambassador Rama Yad, Senior Director of the Africa Center, to formally introduce the ministers and panelists. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, General Ward, um, for your welcoming speech and, uh, and your nice appreciation of the Africa Center's work. Uh, William uh, E. Ward is, uh, as he said, a retired U.S. Army general officer. As the inaugural commander, um, the, he established the U.S. Africa Command in 2007, and he is the nation's first black combatant commander. 
And before AFRICOM, General Ward uh, was the deputy commander of the U.S. European Command, uh, security coordinator of the Israel-Palestinian Authority in Jerusalem and Tel Aviv. Uh, other key command and staff assignments include Somalia, Egypt, and Egypt. Also, he's a teacher at the U.S. Military Academy of West Point. Of course, he's a decorated veteran. Minister Biruta, uh, allow me a few words to introduce you. Uh, you have been Minister of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation of the Republic of Rwanda since November 2019. Before that, between 2011 and 2019, you held three high-level positions, Minister of, of Environment, Minister of Natural Resources, uh, and Minister of Education. You also held the President um, uh, of the Rwandan Senate uh, from 2003 to 2011. You served as the President of the National Transition Assembly uh, from 2000 to 2003, and Minister of Public Works, Transport, and Communication from 1999 to 2000, and Ministry of Health too, from 1997 to 1999. After studying medicine in Belgium, you became a physician, right? Um, Minister Dr. Biruta, I should say, welcome. We are live in our studios of uh, Washington, D.C. And before we start, I would like to share with our audience the coming participation of your colleague, uh, Rwanda's Minister of Environment, Mrs. Jeanne d'Arc Mujawa Maria. She is the former ambassador to Russia and Belarus. A lot to discuss with, uh, with you. Uh, my colleagues, senior fellows at the Atlantic Council, um, Africa Center, will also join the conversation. Uh, Aubrey Ruby, our lead on uh, the economy. Cameron Hudson, our lead on security matters. As usual, an external figure will bring her views from the ground. Today, Jacqueline Moussiwa, um, who is a professor at uh, Georgetown University, will share her experience. First, um, let's discuss uh, together. Uh, Mr. B Minister Biruta, uh, my first question, very simple. What are your goals of your uh, visit, your stay here in Washington? Who will you meet? Who have you already uh, met? What do you expect from uh, the Biden administration uh, policy to, to Rwanda? Uh, we remember uh, when he was a spokesperson of your uh, government uh, at the very beginning of Biden's uh, election, um, you said your willingness to strengthen the ties with the new administration in areas of mutual interest. What are these mutual of uh, uh, these areas of mutual interest? Thank you. Thank you for the introduction and. Uh, let me say that we are here, we are visiting Washington, D.C. Uh, to uh, strengthen the partnership existing between the USA and uh, Rwanda. We are working with the USA in many sectors, including defense and security, climate change, health, education, and many others. So we are here to engage with uh, the, the administration to see how we can take that partnership further. You know that Rwanda is uh, a player in many areas on the continent. We have mentioned security. We are contributing to peacekeeping operations. We are present in South Sudan. We are present in Central African Republic. We are present in Mozambique. And we are here to discuss about how uh, the United States could contribute to the efforts Rwanda is putting in bringing security back to these various areas, among others. But you have also received support from the government of the USA to fight COVID-19. You have received vaccines. You have received ventilators from the US government. And today we are talking about manufacturing of vaccines. And we are ready to partner with uh, the US government to see how we can benefit from technology transfer uh, so that Rwanda and the African cont continent could be a player in the fight against pandemics, including COVID-19, but other pandemics which will, will arise in the future. Mm -hmm. Okay, more broadly, um, uh, I, I'd like to draw your attention on, on the, the, the actions already taken by this, um, this team. More than a year after uh, President Biden's election, um, what is your appreciation of his first steps uh, on the African continent? Uh, the more optimistic mind consider that um, 
uh, very positive that uh, those appointments of uh, Africa experts like uh, Ambassador Linda Thomas Greenfield, we already hosted here, or Samantha Power, um, Biden's early message to the um, to the African leaders attending the African Union uh, summit, the November visit of Secretary Blinken on the African continent in Nigeria, Kenya, and Senegal, um, and on the other hand, others say, "Oh, uh, but we should do better." The Omicron-inspired travel ban, for example. Um, on eight countries in southern Africa, the withdrawal of benefits of the AGOA uh, from three, three other um, African uh, countries. And we have not seen uh, President Biden on the African continent yet. So uh, where do you belong, uh, the, the optimistic or the pessimistic minds? Oh, I'm, I'm optimistic. Uh, and we think that the first steps of uh, Biden administration on the African continent are positive when you consider the COVID-19 pandemic and the contribution of this administration to fight against uh, COVID-19 on the continent, uh, this government has tremendously contributed to vaccines acquisition for African countries. And we know that this administration has been present in many uh, areas on the continent where there are problems like uh, the crisis in Tigray in Ethiopia, uh, and uh, in South Sudan, you have been this administration being active to, towards finding solution to these problems. So considering the context of COVID-19 pandemic, this administration has made very positive steps towards engaging the African continent. And we believe that once this COVID-19 pandemic is behind, behind us, we'll be able to engage more and uh, contribute to the development of the African continent. Hopefully. Uh, obviously, uh, this Africa, um, which America is re-engaging in, is not the same uh, as the one it, might, it may have been, it may have known before. Um, the continent is changing a lot, uh, extraordinary changes, um, which could require a new approach. Uh, China is the first trade partner of the African continent. Uh, the European uh, Union is the first investor on the African continent. And you remember a few weeks ago, um, the president of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, announced a huge global gateway uh, infrastructure uh, plan. Um, several regional powers are also uh, playing their own game um, on the continent, from the Arab, um, United Arab Emirates uh, to Israel. Um, and I would like to speak with you about uh, uh, Israel, one of these new uh, regional players on the African continent. Are you okay with uh, Israel's willingness um, to join um, the African Union as an observer? Um, it, um, Israel decided to open uh, uh, lately uh, its uh, 11th embassy uh, in Rwanda in 2019, um, and it has been noticed as a uh, return of Israel on the African continent. What's your opinion there? Um, what do Africans have to, to win from this observer statue? Let me first of all uh, explain what uh, observer status for Israel to the African Union means. It means just that there is an ambassador who is accredited to the African Union. And considering that uh, Israel is having uh, diplomatic relations with more than 40 countries on the continent, and those countries are member states of uh, the African Union, we think that uh, it is in order for Israel to have that observer status, to have an ambassador who, who is accredited to the African Union. And it is not just only about diplomatic uh, relations. We know that Israel is working with many African countries and uh, various sectors, including agriculture, including security, including technology and many others. So for us, it makes sense that Israel has have an accredited ambassador to the African Union. And to have uh, an Israeli ambassador accredited to African Union doesn't mean in any way that the African Union endorses all the policies of Israel, at least when it comes to the issue of Palestine. African, the African Union has its own position on, uh, on that issue, and we believe that having an ambassador accredited to the African Union would even, would even give to the African Union member states an opportunity to engage more Israel on those issues. 
having an ambassador accredited to the African Union doesn't mean that we agree with Israel on everything, but it would mean that we will be able to engage mm -hmm. Israel even on issues we are not in agreement with the government of Israel. Speaking of uh, the African Union, we remember uh, you chaired the African Union, your country, um, in 2018, um, and as a legacy left a uh, wide range of, of reforms uh, of the African uh, Union um, in terms of funding uh, the organization, um, in terms of, um, of trade, because uh, the decision of the free trade, or rather the largest free trade in the world, has been taken during uh, that time. Currently, the African Union is chaired by, uh, by Senegal. Uh, what are your recommendations um, to uh, strengthen those reforms and um, the African Union policy? We believe that being a chair of the African Union or any other organization is about taking forward the agenda of the, the organization. And uh, Senegal will, among others, uh, take forward uh, the reforms of the African Union, which were initiated in 2018. There are some which are being implemented, but reform, uh, reforms is about a process. So Senegal, we need to take forward these reforms and uh, also to implement the African Union agenda, including the theme of the year, which is related to nutrition, and also uh, take forward the unfinished businesses like uh, silencing the gun, which was the theme of last year. But as, we, as you know, we all know, uh, guns have not been silenced on the continent. So we expect Senegal to take forward that uh, African Union agenda during the chairmanship. When you speak about uh, nutrition, it uh, leads to me, uh, it, makes, it makes me think uh, of um, agri-business, um, agri uh, food insecurity on the African continent. And um, you see where I'm... I'm coming now, um, it's about um, Russia. And when we talk about global powers, regional global powers uh, on the African continent, we think of Russia. General Kipward mentioned very briefly uh, earlier. Um, I have a, a, a few questions here uh, for you and your uh, colleague, Minister of Environment, um, who used to be ambassador uh, of Russia, like a, to Russia, like I said. Um, my, but my first question is, is for you, Minister Biruta. Um, your, your visit happens in a very unstable context, international context. Um, here at the Africa Center, um, one of our missions is to promote an African vision of world affairs. Um, in the short term, um, indeed, the sanctions against Russia have already caused a considerable, ra considerable rise of uh, wet prices of which Russia and Ukraine are the first um, and uh, second producer, largest producers in the world. Uh, the price of the barrel of oil uh, is already at its highest level um, since 2008. Uh, the jump in food prices is, um, will have effects, um, especially on low-income uh, households for, uh, for whom food and energy um, expenses represent uh, a lot in Africa more than um, else, anywhere else. How do you, um, Minister, how do you assess the economic consequences of uh, the Russia invasion um, on Ukraine in your own country? And uh, we know that even before this war, Rwanda was already hit by the effects of the pandemic. But how do you assess the, the consequences of this? You have said it all. Uh, Russia and Ukraine are players in uh, the world economy. And... Uh, as far as Rwanda is concerned, we think that we will be affected by the prices of uh, oil, of course, and we will be eventually affected by the prices of and the availability of fertilizers which we use to import from, from Ukraine. The other uh, maybe element is related to food, the food itself, wheat. We used to import 64% uh, of our wheat from, uh, from Ukraine. And we are likely to uh, to have shortage, and we are looking at uh, alternative sources where we can have uh, wheat from. And uh, we believe that we'll be affected. But uh, for example, for wheat, wheat is not an important element of uh, the, uh, the, the the food system in Rwanda, and we can easily find alternatives. But 
the first election to uh, to consider alternative sources of uh, oil, of wheat, of fertilizers. And we have put in place uh, a team under the Prime Minister which is working on these alternatives while also monitoring the situation around the world. And we believe that we will be able to have mitigation, uh, mitigation measures to prevent uh, our population to be highly affected by the war and mm -hmm. the sanctions uh, which are in place in relation to the situation in Ukraine. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Minister Mujawa Maria, um, we will come back and uh, talk about uh, your portfolio uh, and climate with Aubrey, who will join um, later. But you have been um, ambassador to, to, to in Russia and Belarus. Uh, you spent there uh, five years, uh, four years maybe? Six years, six years. Just, what, uh, just one question about this experience um, in, uh, in the Russian society. Uh, our audience is curious of... Uh, of, an, of hearing an African um, vision of this Ukrainian crisis um, through your voice, um, as Washington and many European countries uh, push to further isolate Russia, um, a lot of African countries decided to abstain um, um, in condemning Russia's invasion at the UN um, General Assembly. Uh, these countries uh, surprised uh, the, the, the Western uh, capitals. From your experience, uh, how do you analyze these, uh, these, these votes? What, that, what does it say uh, about Africa these days? Thank you very much. Based on what my colleague, the Minister of Foreign Affairs said, we, we, we have expressed ourselves as Rwanda, as the United Nations, based on principle. We have voted. We didn't abstain, we voted based on principles. And uh, considering the issue of Russia and the Ukraine and the taking into context of the environment, of course it will affect not only uh, the peoples of Ukraine or Russia. Let, let's consider those problems as climate change issues. You know, Rwanda is now facing impact of climate change, even if we, we are not playing a big role in a contribution to the problem. But uh, the climate change is affecting us, uh, coming from far away. Uh, the same way those problems will affect us even if they are geopolitical problems. But we cannot sit there uh, for the issue of climate change, the way we are devising strategies and methodology to be part of the solution. That is how uh, the minister was saying that we are devising strategy to source in other parts of the world how to solve the problems that are caused by the problem of Russia and the Ukraine. Maybe you can continue this conversation with um, Aubrey uh, Ruby, who is uh, uh, our lead on um, economic and climate issues at the Atlantic Council's Africa Center. Aubrey. Yes, hi, Honorable Minister. Um, it's a pleasure. Uh, we've been following very closely what Rwanda has been doing with the Green Fund and wanted to understand how you think the lessons learned from the Green Fund can inform overall scaling of climate finance uh, for African countries. Yeah, yeah. thank you very much. Uh, first of all, for the last two decades, Rwanda has put environment, climate change at the heart of everything we do, be it uh, uh, policy, programs, projects, uh, we have made sure that each step we take, we take it with environment conscience. And of course, we, we, we have created uh, Wanda Green Fund to make sure that all the support we are getting, all the financial uh, we are getting pass through one basket, which is our green 
a Rwanda Green Fund. Uh, it has helped a lot. It has created uh, green, green jobs. And it has really rehabilitated some of the, the cities into green cities. And of course, we look forward to do more with our uh, Rwanda Green Fund. And uh, it is an example that it can be emulated by our sister countries on African continent. And we have started receiving different delegations coming to, to, to learn from us how, how and uh, how much we are doing for the country through Wonder Green Fund. Obrey, you can continue. I think your um, exchange with the ministers, maybe with the Minister uh, of Foreign Affairs. Yes, and, and I think it's building on that Green Fund experience where Rwanda is trying to pilot things that can be scaled and shown across the continent. Honorable Minister Baruta, you know, Rwanda has positioned itself as a hub of doing business and, and attracting investment for the region um, by doing, you know, rapid bus doing business reforms, by working with RDB um, to be a one-stop shop. And, you know, that's kind of the first phase of what you did on the investment front. Now it seems to me, and I would love your reflection, that you're taking Rwanda brand more to the global stage. So I think about the fact that the Basketball Africa League is, is hosting their uh, final tournament in Kigali, um, the fact that you're sponsoring football teams abroad. So speak to us about this next iteration of Rwanda's investment promotion efforts globally. Let me come back to the question uh, on the voting at the UN General Assembly on the issue of uh, Ukraine. Uh, I want to say that uh, voting at the UN is a, a matter of sovereignty. E each country votes according to its own interests and assessment of the issue at mm -hmm. stake. And that what was done uh, at the UN General Assembly on the issue of, uh, of Ukraine. As my colleague said, uh, Rwanda voted along the principles enshrined in the UN Charter, uh, territorial integrity, sovereignty, and so on. But other member states, including African countries, voted according to their assessment of the, 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 the issue, and uh, they based on their own interest, on uh, the historical background, and many other factors but it is a sovereign matter when it comes to voting at the UN General Assembly. Now, coming back to the question of, uh, in relation to the soft power and uh, how Rwanda is investing in uh, sports, in the event. Yes, sports plays uh, a very important role in promoting relationship between, between nations, but it is also a matter of, uh, it, it can be considered as an investment. As you mentioned, Rwanda has hosted uh, basketball, basketball Africa League, and we host again the finals in uh, the coming month. These last days there have been uh, a tournament in Senegal and in Egypt, and the finals will, be, will take place in Rwanda in uh, the coming month. And we are also investing in um, Arsenal, we are investing with uh, Paris Saint-Germain, France, to promote tourism. And uh, those investments have contributed a lot in promoting Rwanda in uh, the UK, in France, but even beyond, because football and sports in general, go, it is, they, they go beyond the, the, the countries where these teams are based. And mm. you know how many people are watching uh, the Premier League and uh, other tournaments around the world. And uh, Visit Rwanda has been everywhere around the, the world and have, we have started to benefit from those investments. And we, we think we need to do more. We, we do more, we have done it with uh, football, we are doing it with basketball, but we have also invested in the infrastructures which can allow us to host this uh, sports event. 
and we didn't mention cycling. Mm. So Tour de Rwanda has, be, has become famous around the world and uh, every year we see more teams participating and uh, it is uh, broadcasted uh, everywhere and uh, this really tells the, the tourism uh, sector of Rwanda and we, I think we need to invest more beyond cycling, football and uh, basketball. Um, let's continue to, um, to raise these uh, national uh, priorities. Um, I'd like to give the floor to um, Mrs. Jacqueline uh, Musiwa. She's adjunct professor at Georgetown University. Um, because um, you, you said, you, you talked about the COVID-19 uh, behind us, hopefully. Uh, we don't know yet, uh, unfortunately, but, but hopefully. Uh, Jacqueline, you would like to, um, to talk about that. Thank you so much, Rama, and um, to the Honorable Ministers, Murakaza and Inza. Um, just going off the previous theme of Rwanda's leadership on the continent, you know, Rwanda took a very strong stance and measures against to contain COVID-19, to vaccinate the population, and even signed, you know, an agreement with BioNTech to construct, you know, a factory in Rwanda. Now. Even though Rwanda is progressing, other countries close to Rwanda and around the continent are not moving as fast. And as we know, um, if we are not all protected, you know, we're not going to go far in our fight against COVID. So my question to you, Honorable Minister Buruta, is how does Rwanda plan to continue to lead together with institutions like the Africa CDC, the African Union and other regional bodies to try and increase vaccine uptake on the continent in order to reduce COVID infection um, around the continent. Thank you. Rwanda is ready to continue to do the right thing on the continent, be it in uh, fighting against COVID-19 and uh, other, other issues uh, in Rwanda and on the continent. You have said it, Rwanda is investing in uh, vaccine manufacturing in partnership with BioNTech, but also in partnership with uh, other countries like Ghana, Senegal, South Africa, and others. So Rwanda is not doing it alone. And we have taken measures to fight COVID-19. We have been uh, successful so far because the pandemic is not uh, yet be behind us. We hope that uh, uh, that will would be the case, but we are not there yet. But we have invested, we have mobilized our population, we have sensitized, and that has allowed us to reach a vaccination rate of 62.5% of the total population now, or 62.5 have received two doses of the vaccine. Uh, and it is a matter of investing uh, in uh, the, the logistics which were needed for, for us to to receive the vaccine, but also be able to store them properly and to be able to administer them to uh, the population. But it's also a matter of mobilizing, sensitizing the population and having vaccines and being able to, to keep them uh, in the right place is not enough. We needed also to have a health system which is functional so that uh, the vaccine can reach uh, everyone. So we are also working uh, with the African Union. You know, our president is championing the domestic health financing uh, with the African Union. Our president is uh, chairing the Yauda NEPAD. And we are also working with other uh, African Union member states to have a regulatory framework uh, which will, will allow us not only to produce vaccines, but also to have them reg reg regulated in a proper way. So we are working on uh, establishing uh, the African Medicines Agency. It has been uh, adopted by the African Union. Today we are talking about uh, establishing its headquarters and making it operational. So we are trying to do the right things, but we are working with uh, other member states of the African Union, and we, we keep doing that. Um, you, your country is, is um, known uh, for uh, the severe um, measures 
it took against COVID-19, uh, which raised important questions um, about uh, freedoms. Um, I'd like here to continue on the, the, the internal challenges uh, with the political aspects with um, our other senior fellow, Cameron Hudson, who is our lead on security issues. Thank you, Rama, and uh, welcome, Ambassador and Mr. Minister. Uh, thank you for taking the time to join us today. I wanted to ask about uh, Rwanda's regional engagements. Rwanda has traditionally uh, been able to uh, project uh, a lot of force and influence across the region, and we've seen that especially in the last year with deployments in the Central African Republic and in Mozambique. I wonder if you could briefly characterize for us the state of those deployments, uh, the timeline going forward for those deployments, and how you see the, the mission right now, and, and frankly, the threat in, uh, in both of those countries. Yes, uh, Rwanda has uh, deployed the troops in, uh, both in the Central African Republic and in Mozambique. For the Central African Republic, we have a contingent under the UN force, which is there, MINUSCA, but uh, from uh, December 2020, we deployed a force based on a bilateral agreement we, we had with uh, the Central African Republic. When we deployed that force in December 2020, there was a serious threat on uh, not only on the government of Central African Republic, but also on our contingent under the UN, uh, the UN MINUSCA, and we decided to deploy um, a force under the bilateral agreement we had with uh, the Central African uh, government, because that force has had other rules of engagement different from the one of the UN. So it was uh, easy for, for the force to intervene where it was needed, and that force contributed very much to allowing the Central African Republic to hold presidential elections in uh, December 2020 and uh, uh, January, but also to have parliamentary elections. As we speak today, the situation has uh, dramatically improved, and uh, now they are working on political processes to have uh, the security um, strengthened, but also to have stability coming back to that country. They are working with uh, various partners, including uh, the UN, but the force we sent there in December 2020 contributed tremendously to the return of security in uh, the capital, but also in the main cities of uh, the Central African Republic. For Mozambique, we were approached by the government of Mozambique uh, to support them to deal with a uh, security threat which was there, to deal with uh, a terrorist group which has uh, taken over the entire province of Cabo Delgado. And we consulted member states of uh, the region, SADC, South African Development Community, we consulted with them, we consulted other partners, including the African Union, including uh, other P5 members, we, and we decided to send a force there to support the government of Mozambique. That force uh, started uh, operation in July last year, but in uh, less than two months, they were able to liberate uh, an important part of that province of Cabo Delgado. In the meantime, uh, SADC forces also joined. And today we are working with uh, the government of Mozambique forces and uh, the SADC forces. And the situation has very much improved. And today we are talking about uh, working on the stabilization phase. And that stabilization phase will we, we, we lead us to be able to determine when we will be able to withdraw and uh, let the Mozambican forces take over, or either Mozambican forces themselves or with uh, another regional force. But we, the operation is not time bound, it is uh, result bound. So we are still there, we are working and uh, we are making some progress, working with the region, working with uh, the government of Mozambique. And uh, once we think that uh, 
So stability is there that the government of Mozambique can take over. Then we start uh, withdrawing our forces. But uh, we need to just acknowledge that the results uh, are there and we were happy with them. Uh, you can continue, uh, Cameron, uh, with your questions and then I'll, I'll come back later. Sure, thanks. Um, I wanted to quickly ask about uh, Rwandan Congolese relations uh, and the status of um, of your interest there, specifically in the Eastern DRC. Um, there have been uh, some statements made by by your government in response to the M23 um, uh, violence going on. I wonder if you can just update us on where the status of of relations is right now with uh, with your neighbor there. The relationship between Rwanda and DRC are good. There has been uh, that incident you are referring to, but both governments have been in touch and uh, are discussing uh, about the situation. But the reality is that there have been uh, armed groups which have remained active in the eastern part of DRC, not only uh, the XM23 you are referring to, but there are other armed groups like uh, FDA, who, which has been there since uh, 20 years now. So there are armed groups which are still active in Eastern D DRC. But we are talking with uh, the government of DRC and dealing with uh, those uh, incidents, the incident like the one which uh, happened two days ago. Uh, but in general, the, 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 the both governments are talking and the, the relationship is good. What, what do you what do you answer to uh, to the Congolese uh, army who accused uh, your country of backing this uh, rebels movement? There has been a statement by the armed forces of DRC. There has been a clarification from uh, our government, and our ambassador has uh, had a meeting with uh, the minister, my colleague of uh, DRC. So both the government uh, are talking and sometimes uh, there are those statements which uh, sometimes are out there out of emotion, but uh, we need at some point to cool, to cool down and uh, deal with the reality instead of uh, going out and making statements. But uh, there has been a statement from uh, the armed forces of DRC, there has been uh, a clarification from our government. In the meantime, we are talking to each other. And here I have, I have two uh, complementary questions about the situation in the, in the DRC. Um, a, few, a few weeks ago, uh, uh, it was the anniversary of the Addis Abeba Peace um, Security and Cooperation Framework for the DRC and the, and the region. Uh, on the occasion of this uh, uh, ninth, uh, I think ninth uh, anniversary last month, uh, the uh, Congolese um, chief opposition leader, Martin Fayulu, uh, considered by many Congolese as uh, the real president of the DRC, wrote a letter to the UN General uh, Secretary to regret, to regret um, this agreement has been uh, flowed from the very start uh, with these uh, specific commitments uh, required from the DRC. Um, and uh, he was, he was uh, regretting that uh, the other countries, and he, he mentioned Rwanda, was not, were not held um, uh, accountable to any of these pledges, um, and particularly on uh, democratic issues. What would you like to answer to this, uh, to, to, to this statement? Let me start by saying that we recognize uh, President Felix Tshisekedi as a uh, the president of DRC. Uh, as far as uh, that mechanism is concerned, there have been achievement. Uh, the Mr. Fayou, you mentioned, uh, has his own assessment. And uh, you know that he's ready to accuse Rwanda of anything. And uh, every opportunity is good for him to accuse Rwanda of everything going wrong in the, in the region and beyond. So that is own state, uh, his own assessment, but we stick on the assessment which has been made by heads of state of the region concerned with that mechanism. And I believe that there have been achievement, there have been uh, shortcomings, and that uh, the reason why that assessment was made, and I believe the, the heads of state participating in a, 
that meeting have taken measures to, to address remaining issues. So, but that how it, it goes for all other processes. Um, let's stay on, on these uh, issues. Uh, I, I, I heard you met with Secretary uh, Sherman uh, here in the United States um, uh, during your visit. And uh, the question of human rights in your own countries have been raised there with the case of Paul Ruzé Zabangina, uh, who was the, the, the hero of the, the, the Hotel Rwanda, everybody knows. Uh, what did you say to her when she raised that? Because many uh, US uh, NGOs and, and, and everywhere uh, may be um, upset and have raised uh, important protest against uh, his con when he was convicted? Yes, we discussed uh, that issue among others and we agreed that we should let the court do their work. And uh, that case is before the courts and uh, the government of Rwanda could not interfere in court proceedings. And we just needed to wait for the courts to do their work. And uh, we need to respect uh, the institutions of Rwanda as we respect the institution of uh, USA. And uh, they, they have, you have, and they, any other person have uh, right to have concerns, but we need also to respect the, the institutions of every country and to respect its sovereignty. That's the best way to build a strong partnership between countries. Um, still on, on the DRC, uh, I forgot, uh, sorry uh, Jacqueline, uh, I, I think you wanted to add something about the, the DRC. Um, please go ahead, sorry. Thank you. Now, so really quick, the DRC is set to become a member state of the East African community. Um, and so I really just wanted to understand what some of the challenges as well as opportunities are with membership Obviously, expansion, including South Sudan, has been a bit challenging, and so it would be great to just hear your views on, you know, the new member coming in. Thank you. Actually, DRC has become a member of the East African community since uh, two days now, and uh, I think it is a, a great opportunity for the community uh, and uh, the members uh, of that community for, to have DRC is a member of the East, the East African community. I cannot say that there will be challenges. Uh, today I see only opportunities to, to have DRC in the communities, which has grown now to a population of 250 million and, uh, and <coughs> maybe more. So that is a great opportunity for Rwanda and for the other members of the, the East African community. Challenges which are in the community are not uh, only related to South Sudan, and we, know, we are not expecting DRC to, to bring additional challenges to the community. We should expect DRC to bring uh, additional opportunities. Thank you, Jacqueline. Thank you, Minister. Uh, I, uh, I would like to, uh, to, 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 to open the QEA question session uh, through um, the questions asked by our audience. There are so, so many questions, I cannot, you know, um, choose all the questions, but just would like to, um, to draw your attention uh, still on the DRC on a letter written by uh, Gregory Mix, the chairman of the House uh, Foreign Affairs Committee, about the, the next elections in, the, in Congo. He, he said uh, to President Biden, we write you to encourage your attention and prioritization of the upcoming elections in the DRC. This could be a pivotal election for the DRC, and we must ensure that the people of the country are finally fully enfranchised where their will for the country's leadership reflects the votes cast at the polls. So these sentences are uh, extracted from uh, the letter Gregory Mix uh, uh, wrote to uh, the President of the United States, uh, which clearly shows that the Congress wants to keep an eye on the DRC election. We remember uh, the, during the last elections, President Kagame, as a, uh, president of the African Union, uh, was in his way, you know, during the, the, the results of the election. When he was interrupted, uh, it seemed he wanted to find a compromise between uh, the players. Um, but we, we, we never knew about, uh, about what happened then. 
can you can you tell us what you expect from the the upcoming elections in the DRC? E elections uh, in the DRC belong to Congolese. So maybe I should stop there. We don't have any uh, any legitimacy or any plan to interfere in uh, Congolese elections. We hope that the elections will be peaceful and that uh, Congolese will be able to exercise their democratic rights. That is the only thing I, ca I can say about it. When you, our president uh, was chairman of the African Union, it was normal that he find a way to intervene and uh, find a solution to uh, the crisis which was there. And uh, hopefully the, the crisis was, uh, was resolved and the Congo, the RC was able to have uh, a president, we, we, which is good. But we, I should not make comment on uh, the RC election, though that, that, that issue belongs to the sovereignty of Congo and uh, the Congolese. Okay, I'm, I'm continuing on the economic aspects. We have here a question uh, from Dr. Frani uh, She's saying, Rwanda has invested in fourth industrial revolution technologies and capabilities and is also developing its capacity to become a green financing hub. Uh, could you tell us the value of this focus for the integration of Africa and the role Rwanda is playing? I think it's for you, Madam Minister. Thank you very much. As I told you Rwanda has put environment at the heart of everything you do. When we talk about uh, uh, climate finance, when we talk about green investment, even our Rwanda Development Board now is encouraging all investors to go green. So uh, that is uh, something that we are eager on. And uh, uh, even our Ministry of Finance is making sure that the planning and the budgeting of all institutions go green. And uh, we, we are ready to continue in that process because uh, it will show our policy coherence and the political, political consistency in whatever we do. And uh, our green economy should be the only way we can, we can save our planet, starting by Rwanda. Thank you very much. Um, another question on, econo on economy um, from one of the, the attendees um, about the US-Rwanda uh, trade mission. Uh, that will take in place um, very soon, on, in May. Um, there is here a question about um, the, the, how um, could, we, could you facilitate opportunities for American business people um, to, meet, uh, to meet successful business owners from Rwanda uh, who operate in the region? We welcome investors from, from the U.S and from other parts of the world. And uh, this is the reason why we have put in place uh, all uh, the mechanisms and incentives to attract investors and facilitate their investment uh, in Rwanda. So we have uh, an institution, the Rwanda Development Board, which is in charge, among others, of uh, promotion of investment. There are incentives we, which are in place to attract in investors. And we just, we, are, uh, we, we use, the, let me use this opportunity to urge uh, American companies, American investors to come to Rwanda and they look for opportunities to invest uh, in our country. But we have the institution in place, we have incentives, and we, we are every year, we are, prom we are working towards uh, improving the business environment in our country. And uh, this is the reason why we, we are attracting investment from, from uh, the U.S. This is uh, the reason why we are having the, that trade, uh, trade mission, but we are having investors from other parts of the world as well. Thank you very much, Minister. There is a lot of questions. Uh, I, I don't know where to, to start or finish. Um, Minister uh, Bujawa Marima, there is a question here for you. 
what areas of investment in environment that US government or companies can invest in uh, specifically? Uh, what would you privatize? Of course, what are challenges? Uh, uh, but I think you already um, answered about that. What are challenges that Rwanda has uh, that we can say this is where we need much collaboration? I think it's, uh, it may be a US question. <laughs> Yeah, uh, thank you very much. The area of investment uh, are uh, e-mobility, sustainable urbanization, uh, climate smart agriculture, and of course renewable energy. Those are the area of investment for green projects. Thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, I, I'm, I'm flagged like it's, uh, it's the end of our conversation, but we could have spoken so many other um, topics, um, cultural topics, um, the relations with France uh, are raised by our, um, our audience, um, the Department of, of, of Commerce uh, uh, and uh, who will host the, the Rwanda Business Trade Mission is something that, that uh, draws a lot of curiosity. Um, and, and, and always concerns about uh, human rights, uh, as you can imagine. Um, and uh, the regional uh, soft power uh, you uh, promote uh, for Rwanda on the international stage. So, uh, but we don't have time for all this, it's a lot. Um, these uh, large uh, comments and reactions show that uh, Rwanda is, is playing uh, the, the, the game of the soft power. We raised that with the environmental questions, sports, diplomacy, and, uh, and trade. But in the same time, we can see that uh, there is a lot uh, of challenges in a very uh, insecure regions, uh, region, uh, not only on the eastern of, of the DRC, but also the jihadist threat um, in, the, in, in southern Africa. So thank you, ministers, uh, for your uh, participation in this, um, in this conversation. It was a timely conversation. Um, um, we wish you uh, a nice day uh, and nice conversations uh, and helpful and, and, and productive conversation with your, uh, with your uh, interlocutors in the U.S. Uh, thank you very much and uh, see you. Bye -bye. Thank you for hosting us. Thank, thank you. you.